Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ben Tomczyk on behalf of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We're really excited uh, for today's event, which we think is gonna be both timely and topical, and we're thrilled that you can join us. Uh, before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. The first is we are recording this for future use and we will send it out to everybody after today's event. Uh, additionally, we hope to make today's uh, event as conversational as possible. We have a great panel lined up, so we encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator of today's discussion, Mark Goldwine. Mark is the Senior Vice President and Senior Policy Director at the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Mark, thanks for, uh, thanks for moderating today's discussion. Thank you everyone so much for attending today. Uh, I'm really excited to be having this conversation on, on infrastructure at what may actually finally be Infrastructure Week. Um, I know we've been hearing about this for four years, but it's actually that time now. Uh, President Biden has a, at least by our estimates, $2.65 trillion infrastructure plan or a jobs plan at least. Um, and meanwhile, we have a highway bill that needs to be passed by the end of the fiscal year, needs to be funded within a year or so. So we're gonna have a great discussion, not just about the spending, but about how do we actually pay for it all? Um, with us today are four of, I think, the top experts in the field on in the question of how, how we pay for things and how we pay for infrastructure, especially. Um, we have Jeff Davis, who's a senior fellow with the Eno Center of Transportation um, and the editor of Eno Transportation Weekly. We have Chai Ching Huang, who's the executive director of the new Tax Law Center at NYU Law. Um, we have Robert Atkinson, who's the founder and president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, ITIF and was also the chair of the National Surface Transportation Infrastructure Financing Commission. Uh, that's a little bit of a mouthful, but obviously very relevant to our current conversation. And finally, we have Adele Morris, who's the Pension Senior Fellow of Economic Studies and the Policy Director for Climate and Energy Economics at the Brookings Institution. I'm really excited to have uh, this awesome panel with us today, and they're gonna be taking your questions, so please do enter them in the, in the Q&A function so that I can ask them. But we're gonna, we're gonna hit the ground running here and I'm just gonna start with you, Jeff. Can you give us an overview of what's in President Biden's new uh, American Jobs Plan? Uh, sure, it's uh, calling for $2.3 trillion of spending uh, over a period of years, we're not sh quite sure how many, mostly front loaded. I'm told the number to compare the transportation part is five, there's an eight year span on uh, some other amounts. I'm not sure if that's BA or if it's spend out, but uh, you can see that uh, if I'm sharing my screen properly, you can break it up into four separate buckets based on a continuing OMB analysis of what's of what they call investment that, of definition of which has been the same in every budget since 1952. And it breaks down investment into three categories, major public physical assets, capital spending of which infrastructure is a part, other and then uh, other federal investments, which include conduct of research and development and conduct of education and training. And by my count, about 810, 815 billion dollars of this money is for infrastructure. About 398 is other physical capital. 680 for other federal investments that could probably fit those OMB criteria. And then 400 billion dollars for uh, subsidizing elder care, basically. Um, this is the list of the various categories of federal investment. You can see. For the breaking down the infrastructure to transportation, drinking wastewater, broadband, power electrical grid, and resiliency upgrades for all of the above to include not just, uh, again, it's not just publicly owned assets. It can also include assets of natural monopolies, which are regulated in form of public function, like private railroads, private electrical companies, private broadband companies serve the public. And then other physical capitals, mostly construction money for various things like housing, schools, colleges, Childcare facilities, VA hospitals, public buildings. Uh, then other investments, R and D, invest in manufacturing. I don't have the details on yet. Workforce development can be considered education and training. And then most there's a big amount of money for electrical vehicles in there, of which they just said 100 billion is for point of sale rebates on the purchase of when people like you and me go buy EV. So it's not really publicly owned. You can't call it infrastructure, but it's investment in something. Um, and on the transportation side, it's about 456 billion, 25% of it for highways, 20% of it for mass transit when you include a $25 million 
chunk of the EV money that's to specifically replace mass transit diesel buses with electric. Uh, since that is already being done in, a in an existing transit program, I classify that as transit funding, not EV funding. 80 billion for intercity rail, the bulk of which will be spent on Amtrak's Northeast Corridor. 44 billion for transformational mega projects that cross modal or boundary lines. $25 billion for airports and air traffic control. 17 billion for ports and ports of entry. $20 billion for road safety. And as a multiple of what we're spending now, that's probably the biggest increase in here. And then $25 billion for uh, equity considerations to try to, in some instances, mitigate the negative effects that previous installations of transportation infrastructure have had on underserved communities and communities of color. So, great. All right, and so that's basically what's in it. And uh, if, if there was a detailed breakdown released by the administration or leaked from the administration yesterday that explained, for example, that uh, of that 80 billion for rail, 39 for the Northeast Corridor, 16 for the rest of Amtrak, 5 billion for freight rail and safety, which leaves only 20 for other non-Amtrak inner city passenger rail, which I took as a good sign that the most that the California project California High Speed Rail could get out of this is a fraction of that 20 instead of trying to eat up the whole 80. Um, and also $15 billion as public infrastructure to build and install a half a million electric vehicle chargers, which uh, I don't think that'll go as the 15 billion will go uh, you know, to do 500,000, but uh, I'm waiting for other expert announcements on that. So that's basically what's it. Thanks so much. I should say, now that we webcast this, we're actually pro California Rail because we have California listeners that <laughs> um, we didn't used to have for live events. Um, so, Chai Cheng, President Biden, the Biden administration has put forward offsets to pay for this plan by their estimates over 15 years, um, and mainly from corporations. Can you talk a little bit about what's in their financing plan? Sure. So, I think just recall first that the 2017 tax law had really deep permanent corporate tax cuts, um, and those added to deficits permanently offset with measures that reduced health coverage and raised individual taxes across the board with a slower measure of inflation. And on the corporate international side, the Biden plan proposes to reverse part of those deep corporate tax cuts, as well as making some structural changes to the international tax system. So it would reverse part of the deep rate cut by setting the domestic corporate rate at 28% instead of 21%. Uh, and it would do what I would consider as, as basically a job of salvaging and strengthening some key elements of the international tax system. Uh, it would raise the rate on foreign profits for US multinationals to at least 21%. So that would still be a gap with the domestic rate, but uh, narrowing that gap. Um, and there are some additional changes that would make it, I think, structurally sounder, that minimum tax that's known as guilty in the code at the moment. Um, it would turn a fairly muddled base erosion provision, a provision designed to prevent uh, uh, companies making big payments to shift profits into tax havens. It would turn that into a new acronym called SHIELD. Um, I think, importantly, that has some, some quite strong rationales, both from a purely domestic perspective in terms of strengthening revenues and the economy, but also would have some synergies with multilateral negotiations that are ongoing at the moment in ways that could help uh, reverse the race to the bottom on corporate taxes in a way that could help shore up the fiscal systems, both of, of rich countries, but also uh, low income countries. Uh, it would get rid of one of the acronyms that it's there at the moment, FIDI. Uh, it looks awfully locked like an export subsidy and it does have WTO problems. So that in my view is a good way to go. Um, outside of the, uh, of the international sphere, the plan says that it would provide the IRS with resources to pursue large corporations that don't meet their tax obligations. Still waiting for details on that, but what I'm really hopeful for is that it would uh, involve mandatory funding to restore IRS ability to audit both corporations and individuals uh, the rates of those audits have plummeted over the last 10 years due to deep cuts in the IRS budget. Uh, and, and while we're trying to sort of shelf things under the, the rubric of infrastructure, I would make the case that that's pretty um, core public fiscal infrastructure that should be rebuilt. Um, and we also don't, uh, there are a couple of other pieces about that that we, that we don't know and can um, turn to in a bit. 
Uh, there's a proposal that would address differences between income that companies report on their books uh, for um, uh, financial statement purposes and for tax purposes. That one I'm a little bit concerned about the extent to which it's administrable and probably is my least favorite of the proposals in this space. Uh, and there are a number of smaller raises in there too. Thanks very much for that for that summary. Very, very, very helpful. Um, at the same time that President Biden has put forward this sort of massive infrastructure, infrastructure plus bill, um, we have a highway bill that's going to expire in September 1st. We have a highway trust fund that's running out of money pretty quickly um, by our estimates some point in 2022. Rob, can you talk a bit about what's going on with the highway trust fund and what are some of the revenue options and financing options to secure that fund in particular? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, first of all, the Highway Trust Fund is a mythology. It's not you know, the only reason we think that there's a shortfall is because we've set a target for spending. If we could eliminate the shortfall in the Highway Trust Fund by just reducing the amount we think we have to spend. And the reality is that the, what, where the target of the Highway Trust Fund is, is vastly below what we need to be investing. So the shortfall, the, sh the quote shortfall is just, it's just a meaningless Washington term. It, it, it doesn't really mean anything. The real question is sort of what should we be spending? And if you look at sort of the, unfortunately, I didn't, couldn't find the DOT. DOT does an annual report called Conditions and Performance Report for Highways, Bridges, and Transit. I haven't, maybe they stopped that. I couldn't, I found a recent one. And uh, it, it was basically, we need to be spending about, uh, about $30 billion more per year just on roads uh, and another $8 billion on transit if we're going to maintain and modestly improve the system. Now, what improvement means is improvement in, uh, in uh, traffic times and reduce congestion. So, you know, how can we pay for all of this? I mean, I think the Biden proposal is good uh, in terms of what it's spending on. Although what's interesting is it's spending basically five times more on transit relative to transit's current share of spending. So this is a very transit focused package that people haven't commented on. And secondly, what's really interesting is if you notice in there, the link is it's, it's all about improve, it's not expand. So I'm be, I'd be skeptical that any of this money is gonna go for needed expansion. And if you, anybody lives in Washington or Boston or Atlanta or LA, you know we have to expand roads because we're just you know clogged at the gills. How do you pay for it? I, th I think it's a mistake for the administration to pay for this by raising, at least pay for this portion, I should say, by throwing in corporate tax increases. Corporate tax increases will reduce growth and competitiveness. But the way to pay for this is the way we've always paid for it. Ever since the Highway Trust Fund was established in the 1950s, it was always a user pay system. It was never envisioned to be a general fund system. And uh, that's the way we should pay for it. Now, the question is, is the gas tax still a viable way? Of course it is. We could double the gas tax tomorrow if we want to do. We haven't raised the gas tax in inflation adjusted terms since 94, I believe. And during that time, uh, gas mileage per uh, you know, vehicle gas mileage efficiency has gone way, way up. So the average American is paying a third of what they were paying, say, in the 1990s to drive on our roads. It's ridiculous. However, we've long argued, uh, and particularly when I chaired this national commission, that we should move to a vehicle miles travel tax. And it's certainly something that both House and Senate and Republican and Democrats are beginning to talk more seriously about. Uh, Secretary Buttigieg has talked about this as well. Ultimately, we way we should do it is everybody pays by miles driven. Uh, this could be done in a privacy privacy protective way. Anyway, that would be the way I would pay for all of this, not uh, the, the transportation part, not not through tax increases on, on corporations. Thanks. I'm going to have more questions about that in a bit, minute, but um, thanks very much for that summary. Um, Adele, I want to um, close with you before we kind of go into, into the more detailed questions and some that we're getting from the audience already. But given especially that a big part of this effort is, is about addressing climate change, um, what role do you think a carbon tax can and should play um, in, in paying for new infrastructure investment? Thanks, Mark. And, and thanks to your organization for holding this uh, important discussion. I'm delighted to be with you. Um, a carbon tax fits very sensibly within the infrastructure package as it's designed now as a paper, but also in support of the environmental goals of some of the other provisions in that plan. And I think you have to 
compare a carbon tax or a greenhouse gas tax more broadly to alternative ways of paying for that for those investments and to alternative ways of achieving emissions reduction. And I think a carbon tax wins on both scores. And I'll give you a few reasons why. And you heard from, from Rob, and I'm sure you've heard from others that you know when you when you tax corporate income, um, you can discourage incentives to save and invest. And so, you know, we want a pro-growth tax system. Now, I think one could easily argue that uh, corporate tax rates may have been lowered more than necessary. So some, some part of the pay for for this could, could sensibly be uh, reforms to the corporate system at, as it was left after the last adjustments. Um, but I think in lieu of raising it as high as perhaps the Biden administration has um, suggested you could you could raise it by less and then use a carbon tax as another component to that. And so we know from various uh, publications, the CBO scores out uh, a greenhouse gas fee uh, regularly in their options book for reducing the federal deficit. The most recent one was from December 2020, and they priced out a carbon tax at, um, that would start at $25 per ton of CO2 equivalent and rises over uh, 5% over inflation each year subsequent to that. And they estimate over the first 10 years that the tax would raise about a trillion dollars. Another score for a more ambitious price trajectory comes from the Treasury Department at the very end of the Obama administration, a uh, 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 carbon fee starting at around $49 per ton of CO2, rising a little slower at 2% over inflation, could raise about $2 trillion. So we're, look, we're talking real money, and it really could go a long way to, to work to fund, fund in, infrastructure package. But I think more importantly, the CO2 tax would bolster the economic, I mean, the environmental benefits of of both this infrastructure plan and the energy related provisions of the previous stimulus bill. And, and I'll tell you why that is. The, the alternatives to the carbon tax to achieve are, you know, anything like major emissions reductions are either gonna be new legislation uh, that targets kind of on a sector by sector basis, such as the clean electricity standard, which then raises the question of what you're doing for all the other parts of the greenhouse gas inventory, or it's gonna be using existing regulatory authority under the, primarily under the Clean Air Act. And the challenges to those two options are numerous. I will say that there's no question that a carbon tax could fit neatly within the confines of a reconciliation approach. If they, if they choose to go through reconciliation, there's no question that that would pass a parliamentarian test whereas a clean electricity standard may not make that cut. Um, also, I think an economy-wide price signal gives a market for all those technologies we're investing in, both in this plan and in the, the stimulus bill. And with the carbon tax, you can introduce other measures that accomplish important distributional and economic goals, such as imposing a border carbon adjustment so that our industries are not disadvantaged relative to um, uh, in their counterparts in other countries. And we can include provisions that protect coal workers and, and fossil fuel reliant communities as we make this transition to a low carbon economy. It would be faster certainly to do it with new legislation than through a piecemeal sector by sector regulatory approach. And it would be much less vulnerable to reversal when we have, say, a, a, a president who's not supportive of climate goals, we won't, we will, I think, better avoid the seesaw of regulatory ambition. And we've seen that several times now, and it is not the way to efficiently steer a large economy to, to a, a lower carbon future. And you can also include in a carbon tax bill provisions that hold lower income households harmless by taking some of the revenue and either rebating it to lower income households or bolstering the social safety net for the, that benefit in a way that benefits those 
households. I also think the key thing is because climate is a global challenge, we need a policy that's diplomatically robust. And I don't think anything could be more uh, leverageable diplomatically than a clear, predictable um, price on carbon that we can then encourage other countries to, to match us um, and you know, provide a whole new avenue through which we could uh, come to climate agreements through like carbon price floors and that sort of thing. Thank you so much. And um, we have about a million questions already from the audience. So I'm gonna try to um, synthesize them and get through them and, and see if I can sneak in a few of my own. Um, Rob, I'm gonna start with you because there's a bunch of questions on the, the uh, VMP, the vehicle miles traveled fee. Um, and I can't collapse all of them into a single question, but I'm gonna try to get the major ones. Um, there are concerns raised here that a VMT would have privacy issues, that it would be regressive, it would mostly be paid by, by low-income folks, and questions about how you differentiate between um, corporations and freight that's using um, you know, big trucks versus uh, commuters and, and, and drivers in cars. So could you talk a little bit about how you might design a VMT to address these issues, privacy, regressivity, and sort of trucks versus cars? Yeah, I don't know if anybody has ever seen one of these devices, but um, I have one. It's pretty cool. It actually has a GPS in it. Uh, Apple does not know where I am right now. Okay, I know where I am. My phone knows where I am. In other words, any system that we would design and require to be in cars would be a one-way receiver of GPS information. The government, and, and by the way, just let your... Our commission went totally involved in that. I can guarantee you 100%, this is much more privacy protective than toll roads because when you go through a toll road with a transponder, it knows that at least your car went through there at a particular time. You can and should design a VMT system that the only thing the government ever knows about you is that you owe them $12 or you owe them $2. They don't know when you drove, who drove, where you drove, when at the time of day, they just know that you drove in this jurisdiction. Uh, in the state of Maryland, let's say. So no private information is ever shared other than just you pay them money. And you can design a system that that, as other countries have done, that's automatically deleted once the payment is in there. It's deleted from the computer system. Courts or any you know, judges can't go back and look at it. So totally privacy protective. Second thing on regressivity, uh, you know, the question is, are we now taking all taxes off the table unless they're like 100% progressive? Uh, actually, uh, it turns out that higher income drivers drive more um, and therefore they pay more on the gas tax than lower income drivers now. Now as a share of their income, they pay less because they make more. But it's not purely like everybody has the same, everybody pays the same gas tax or everybody pays the same VMT. Uh, higher income drivers will pay more. Uh, There's one study that showed that uh, the top quintile is responsible for 35% of the carbon emissions. So to Adele's point, if you have a carbon emissions, uh, carbon tax, the top quintile is gonna be paying more than the lower in quintile. They're not gonna pay more of their income, uh, I get that, but they will be paying more in absolute dollars. So if we've now taken off anything other than perfectly progressive taxes, sure. But I don't think we should do that. The other reason is this is really a user fee. It, it really is a user fee. People have a responsibility to pay for this thing they're using, I would argue. Um, last question is on trucks. Um, trucks actually impose significantly more damage on highways than they pay for, largely through pavement damage. Uh, and we, sh we can and should have a VMT system that is put on trucks. And you take away all the other taxes, by the way, that trucks pay. Uh, they pay tire taxes, they pay axle fees, all this other stuff. Take that away and just simply charge a VMT fee for trucks that's related to axle weight. So if you have really heavy axles and they're driving on a road that shouldn't, they shouldn't be driving on, they're gonna do an enormous amount of damage like a hundred times or a thousand times more than a car, they're gonna pay a lot for that. So to me, that would lead to a lot more efficiency. We would, we would reduce, I mean, one of the reasons why pavement is crumbling to the extent it is, is, is because of trucks. So putting a VMT on both trucks uh, and, uh, and passenger vehicles, I think is the right way to go. Would you do the same VMT on them or different uh, 
different type of VMT for trucks or different size? Well, you know, absolutely you do a different one. And, I, and kind of to Adele's point, one of the beauty of a VMT system is it becomes essentially a platform that every car would have, every vehicle should have, I'd say. And then you would put on top of that certain things. So for example, some cities might want to use congestion pricing. Uh, and then you can say, okay, well, you're paying, everybody's paying, you know, I don't know, three cents a mile. But if you're driving in on the Beltway in DC at, at, at nine in the morning on a Monday, you're going to pay 20 cents a mile. So you can layer that on. You could layer on, uh, as you should, I think, also a, a, a carbon tax. So an electric car would only pay the three cents, but a big old gas guzzler might pay a higher rate. Uh, and the same thing with trucks. You would you would set the truck VMT fee to the overall amount of cost that they're imposing on the system, and then adjust that by axle weight and kind of road. So it's a, the beauty of it is it's a great, economists love this because it basically it aligns prices and costs. Uh, now that doesn't mean that policymakers love it, but economists love it. There's, there's one thing though, I agree with everything Rob said, except that you'd probably realistically need to get a lot more money out of it than we currently get out of the gas taxes to make it worth doing, simply because motor, federal motor fuels taxes aren't paid directly by the consumer. They're, they're actually collected at the, at the wholesale rack or tank farm, maybe, maybe 1,300 or so points of collection. Very efficient for the IRS to collect $35 billion a year from 1,300 points of collection. VMT fee requires the IRS to install boxes in 275 million vehicles, and then come up with some kind of direct financial relationship with 228 million licensed drivers, many substantial number of whom don't make enough money necessarily to file income tax. So the admin burden for the IRS in implementing a VMT fee versus the current gas tax collection is so many quantum leaps greater that I think you'd really have to uh, increase the overall amount uh, collected each year to kind of make it worth it while. We still have never seen any estimates from Treasury or IRS on what it would cost to uh, to collect a VMT, what it would cost them in manpower to collect a VMT fee. And I keep telling my friends on the tax committees to get estimates like this from, from Treasury and IRS. Well, I guess, Jeff, I would, I, I mean, we did look at that in our, when this commission that Congress created, although I have to say it's, well, I don't know, a long time ago, 12 years ago, maybe. And so, but even though, you know, we, we understood that and, and the compliance cost or collection costs are going to be higher with this, okay? They're not gonna be an order of magnitude higher for the simple reason that most cars that you would buy today, and by the way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this as a retrofit. I'd do this as a phase in at least for 10 years or so. So as you come off the line with a new car, they essentially have pretty much all of that there. They're GPS enabled, they have a smart box. You just have to add some software. And secondly, all of the collection and everything is, is, is automated. It, it, it's not like some, somebody filling out a form and sending it into some IRS employee in Philadelphia and, and, and you know, writing it down. Totally automated, totally through wireless communications, usually with a credit card, but for folks who don't have a credit card, you can come up with payments. So I agree with you, a little bit more expensive, but it's not that much more. But the savings from efficiency that you get from doing this vastly outweigh the costs. Uh, at least that's what our commission concluded and believed. So, so all the savings of a, you know, there's an interesting study, a pilot study on this, and they found that just forcing people to know that they're actually paying by the mile, it's sort of one of these behavioral economics things. We should, we should know that, but we don't. It actually led people to drive 10% less because it's in their mind every time they're driving, oh, I'm paying. And so you get behavioral changes that are kind of positive as well, or people might change the time of day they, they drive. And so you don't need to expand as much roads because there's less, uh, the, the traffic is more spread out over time or mode. So anyway. Well, that does make me wonder if we're tracking for our miles, everyone's miles, maybe we can get a little bit of that tax gap. Well, we're not tracking, well, by the way, never use that term, um, Mark. We're not tracking. People deducting there, not tracking. If we're counting everyone's miles, maybe yes. they, we get some better data on how much they're deducting from their business taxes. But um, that's, um, I, I want to go to Chai Ching not to ask about that, but to ask more about the uh, global minimum tax. There's a few questions about, about this tax. And they basically come down to how would the Biden administration proposal differ from what we have now? And to what extent does it rely on other countries sort of playing ball and entering in multilateral agreements or, or having their own uh, minimum taxes for, for it to be successful? That's a, that's a great question. So I think, you know, the, 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 the big thing that I mentioned already was that the rate would be a lot closer for the, what multinationals pay on their foreign profits compared to the US domestic rate. But in, a, in addition to that, um, it would remove some of the harmful incentives of this existing tax called guilty, uh, especially one uh, provision that at the moment allows uh, 
more income from those foreign uh, affiliates to escape tax, the more that they have uh, tangible investment offshore, which creates an incentive to have tangible investment offshore as opposed to in the US, which uh, is arguably harmful from some perspectives. Uh, it also creates a, a, a way that there is a lot of uh, profit that is completely sheltered from that minimum tax, which, which thereby creates incentives to actually shift profits offshore to tax havens. Um, another reason why that's the case is that this minimum tax is calculated on a basis that allows you to pull uh, income and taxes from high tax countries and from low tax countries. And by averaging, it creates an incentive to both move profits to low tax countries where they can be sheltered by profits earned in high tax countries, making the US potentially in some cases the least attractive place to put the profits or investment. So it addresses some of those structural issues as well as changing the rate. Um, along with the changes to that, that sort of core piece of the minimum tax, the other piece that I did mention was this, this change of the base erosion excise tax into this uh, new acronym SHIELD. Um, this, I think this change would, would uh, the rationale that I would um, consider the new, the, the BEATS rationale was always a little bit muddled. I think it was supposed to try to address payments that were uh, base erosion in the sense that they were likely to be moving profits uh, from high tax countries to low tax countries, but it was both over-inclusive and under-inclusive in ways that really kind of muddled the rationale and what it was achieving in practice. Um, the new thing that has been proposed would be more targeted at preventing uh, profit shifting by foreign based multinationals. Uh, and, and that would do so in a way which would basically not allow them to use tax havens in a way that gave them tax advantages in the US, um, in the US or other uh, economies as they're doing business. Um, now that itself is potentially a, a sound rationale for changing the beat into shield, uh, even if you just stopped there and you didn't get other countries saying that they would move forward with similar uh, types of structures. But in the, in the context of these ongoing multilateral negotiations, it could create a center of gravity for those other countries to coalesce around in a way that did create um, additional, uh, additional sort of um, backstops against this race to the bottom that you're seeing globally at the moment. So I think uh, it has both domestic and multilateral drivers that, are, that are, you, can, you can tease apart. Um, I think I saw in the chat one of the other questions sort of sort of said, well, like, isn't getting a multilateral agreement really hard? And, and, and yes, any kind of multilateral agreement is, is pretty tough. Uh, but I think there's two important things to remember about that. One is that this uh, is a once in a century moment to try. So I think trying to trying to get that uh, done is, is a very important thing to do. And the second is that you don't need unanimity for this, uh, th this sort of agreement to have real um, uh, to have real changes in the way that countries are behaving, even if you had just a number of the biggest trading and investment partners of the US to get on board with this, you could have uh, quite substantial impacts on the way that both multinationals are doing business and other countries are thinking about their tax regimes. Thank you so much. Um, Adele, there's a few questions about carbon tax here. And one is, um, I, I, I'll try to kind of mix a couple of them in, but do you worry about any economic, economically harmful effects of a carbon tax? And instead of a carbon tax, which is on the takeaway side, why not just have a, a bunch of renewable energy tax credits, a ton of tax credits to, to solve this on the, on the giveaway side, the incentive side? Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. So I, there's no question that um, trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions can involve a cost relative to uh, polluting the air. But so you, then you have to ask, okay, well, what are the damages from unchecked climate change? What are the, what are the damages from the buildup of greenhouse gases that then leads to sea level rise and ocean acidification and extreme weather events and droughts and floods and, and stronger hurricanes? And so clearly, uh, from the research, we know that reducing greenhouse gas emissions can be done very cost effectively. And one reason economists are so nearly unanimous about supporting 
a, a greenhouse gas tax approach or, or perhaps a cap and trade approach that also puts a price on those emissions is precisely because it gives the incentives to the marketplace to choose abatement that is at least cost, right? So, um, you know, compare, you know, people say, well, isn't a carbon tax costly? It's, well, relative to what? It's less costly than alternative approaches and it's less cost costly than unchecked climatic damages. Um, and with regard to renewable tax credits and tax credits in general, one of the problems with using tax credits to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and, and here we're probably talking about the production tax credits and the investment tax credits that have applied to renewable energy. There's several fold. Number one, these technologies have actually become very nearly cost competitive or cost competitive relative to, to fossil alternatives in many areas. And therefore the tax credit simply goes to people who are gonna do things anyway. And also it overlaps with policies at the state level that already mandate a certain share of renewable electricity in their electricity mix. So you're again, paying people for, to do things that they would have done anyway. Um, and so from a, um, a, a cost effectiveness standpoint, these investment and production tax credits are not efficient relative to charging for the remaining emissions. And then they have the incentive to go beyond any particular standard because there's a cost to every ton that, that is emitted. And again, the other, the other thing too is those price signals induce incentives to create new technologies that are even cheaper yet, right? So if you subsidize an existing technology, you're not necessarily producing the incentives for the innovation uh, that we really need to bring those costs down even further. Um, so, you know, in the meantime, are those credits better than nothing? I would say yes, but they are certainly not a substitute for a more comprehensive economy-wide um, incentive system to, to deploy new technologies and to develop them. Jeff, let's talk legislative process for a minute. So there's gonna be one, two, three, four, 25 reconciliation bills coming up over the next year, right? Um, how much of this infrastructure package can actually fit into reconciliation? And what about the highway bill? Can that fit in reconciliation or do they need to do something else there? The, the Byrd rule says that anything in the bill has to directly affect uh, the deficit. So it's gotta be uh, affect outlays from spending that's contained in the bill or else underlying statute or uh, change revenues. And because the, 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 trans, the highway trust fund has, has gotten itself into a little weird budgetary no man's land over the years, there's not much that can be done with the highway trust fund and reconciliation because everything that happens to the trust fund winds up, the, the, the spending gets scored against the annual appropriations bills. And so nothing you know, traditionally, uh, you, you, you can't, if, if, if the money is getting scored against the annual appropriations bills, then it can't go in a reconciliation bill. Uh, similarly, bailouts of the highway trust fund, if you just want to do it on general fund transfer, those generally don't score, although there's a weird provision that would, that, that, that makes that iffy, it would be subject to a parliamentarian determination in the case of, of the highway trust fund. Similarly, uh, the, the surface transportation bill usually authorizes future appropriations for things like mass transit and rail and Amtrak that wouldn't fly. And if you're going to go in and amend any of these provisions in Title 23 for highways or Title 49 of transportation that are about policy, you would have to prove to the parliamentarian that, that would change the outlays from the spending that's contained in the reconciliation bill. So there's a lot of, of surface transportation stuff that's going to have to go separately uh, in, any, in any event. Is this question is for all of you and they want to answer, but let's keep your answers to 20 seconds or so. Is there a conflict between carbon tax, gas tax, and VMT. One is trying to charge everyone, including users of electric vehicles. The other one is encouraging more fuel efficiency. The third one is putting a tax on, on all energy at a different level. Is there a conflict between the three? And if so, which one should we ditch? Which one should we keep? Let's uh, start with Adele. Yeah, so a carbon tax acts like a gas tax because it would tax the carbon in uh, transportation fuels. So there have even been bills that would swap out the federal gas tax with a carbon tax 
or it could sit on top of the existing federal and state excises on gasoline and diesel and be an increment. So for example, a $25 per ton of CO2 carbon tax is roughly 25 cents a gallon of gasoline. So you can just think, and but then, but then it also applies to the other fossil fuels that um, contribute to climatic change. Rob, can we have all three? Can we only have two? Can we only have one? Which ones? Yeah, we can have all three. By the way, I just want to respond to something Adele said. I, you know, yeah, green tax, can, carbon tax can reduce uh, somewhat, but there's no way we can solve climate change with anywhere near the existing technologies we have. We have to have an innovation strategy. A price strategy won't get us there. It'll get us modest reductions. You can have, and in my view, what you should have is you should have a VMT, and the VMT on top of it, the core part of it is driving the roads. It's a user fee. You got to pay for the roads you use. If you're using one road that's super expensive to use, you got to pay for that. Then on top of that, you would have another fee that says, what am I paying? What are my costs I'm imposing on the environment? So if I'm in a high polluting car, I'm going to pay a higher fee for my carbon. If I'm in an electric car, I'll probably pay zero or a lower fee for that because there's some carbon depending on where you get your electricity from. So they're not at all in contradiction at all. Um, but I would really resist this notion somehow that we separate out either the gas tax or the VMT from the highway trust fund. We got to get back to that, not, not go the other way. We should be paying for roads through user fees. I think, what do you, what do you think? Uh, Chaching, is uh, user fees the way to go? How do we think about these three kinds of taxes? Well, I'm going to ask, answer a slightly different question by adding one more into the mix, which is um, of, of all of the consumption taxes that have been discussed, uh, corrective consumption taxes that address carbon consumption or other types of uh, environmental hazards are among my favorites because of not only the revenue that you generate, but because you're having this corrective effect at the same time. So I would, I would not, I, I won't weigh in on the on the choice or the complementarity between the three, but um, uh, given a choice between a, a VAT and something that is uh, more like a carbon tax or uh, a corrective tax, I think I would go in that direction. Yeah. In terms of what they're taxing, carbon tax is kind of, and, 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 and gasoline tax are kind of duplicative, but the, the key is how they're spent, because right now, by law, if your state, buy, you know, if, 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 if the federal government gets more gasoline taxes out of your state, you get more highway money to spend. And so in that respect, it's the current gasoline tax, the way, the fun, the, the way it's linked to the funding is the opposite of a carbon tax, because, because Texas, we have to keep giving Texas more and more highway money every year because they use so darn much gasoline and particularly diesel fuel from their trucking uh, system. So you would have to uh, completely deconnect uh, the gasoline tax from the current system of rewarding higher consumption financially rather than uh, punishing it, which I, I would gather would be the whole point of a carbon tax. Okay, let's, let's talk about the tax gap for a little bit because charging you mentioned funding the 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 administration had sort of some vague language about funding the IRS for corporations. Um, how much can we do for better funding the IRS to actually reduce or close the gap between uh, taxes owed and taxes uh, paid? How much do we need to make policy changes and you know to IRS authority or, or things like that? And how much do we just need to close the loopholes and that are kind of creating the opportunities for avoidance in the first place? This is another case where where it's everything is very complementary. It's, it's like base broadening and, and rates. You probably don't want to rely too much on one lever or another. Um, you know, you, you can change the underlying tax rules in a way that makes gaming less uh, attractive, especially by aligning rates and uh, reducing tax shelters. Uh, but if you don't have a, a basic functioning tax revenue collection system to uh, ensure that those rules are followed, that then you're not going to be maximizing. So I think you want some of all of the above. The, the very most important thing right now is multi-year mandatory funding that allows the IRS to build back up to uh, you know, levels that are consistent with where it was in 2010 and then get beyond that to adjust for the fact of a, a larger population, more things that it has to do. Uh, new new uh, threats to tax compliance like crypto and offshore tax accounts and various other things that it may have to implement soon. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, give a restored IRS the types of tools for information reporting, technology, other types of compliance activity that would uh, complement all of those. 
what are the types of compliance activity that can include things like being available to answer the phones when people who want to comply with their taxes are trying to get hold of a revenue agent or talk to someone when they're facing uh, an audit. So all of these things would, would help both uh, uh, both with the, the, the co collection and, and enforcement of existing laws, but also help uh, honest filers to comply. Jeff, looks like you wanted to make a comment. Just say that let's hold off 24 hours on, on what you just said, because the IRS enforcement budget has been held back since 2010 because of the annual caps on discretionary appropriations of which IRS collection and enforcement are a part. Those caps have expired, and tomorrow we will see if President Biden's first budget that is not constrained by any caps at all will have any kind of quantum jump in IRS enforcement appropriations requests to make up for the last 10 years of, of, of stagnation or not. So we'll, we'll find out tomorrow if they're taking this seriously or not. That's a, that's a great point. I would also say that it will be silent on a multi-year mandatory stream, even if you uh, sort of, if their request is sufficient in the appropriated stream, what you really do want is for the IRS, given how dilapidated it is right now, to know that it's going to get a certain amount of money over a, f a future period that allows it to, to think about actually hiring and onboarding and training staff, which takes multiple years and which you might not want to do if you're relying on the appropriations process and an uncertain uh, sort of uh, makeup of Congress and, and appropriations. Um, so I think that's another another ex instance of both and. I think there needs to be both uh, driving through the appropriations process, especially because in appropriations, it's uh, somewhat easier to uh, wrap around oversight and other types of um, authorities and requirements that you might want to see along with additional money and that sort of multi-year injection through a mandatory stream. Rob and Adele, are there the same kinds of tax compliance issues that we see with the corporate individual code? Um, are we likely to see those as well with the carbon tax or with the VMT? Well, one of the beauties of a carbon tax is that it is incredibly administrable. The Congressional Research Service estimates that we could cover over 70% of the whole US greenhouse gas inventory with under 3,000 taxpayers. And many of those taxpayers already pay federal excises on fossil fuels. For example, uh, nearly all the coal produced in the United States is subject to a tax that funds the Black Lung Disability Trust Fund. And so a carbon tax that applies to coal would sit neatly on top of that existing excise and require very little extra administrative effort or uh, compliance paperwork or any of that kind of thing. And so I think of all the options on uh, funding the infrastructure package from an administrative standpoint, the carbon tax, I think, really wins. And these, these excises are very, um, uh, very well administered. Yeah, I think I'm, certainly a VMT is, is, is more complicated, but I wouldn't, it, it sounds super complicated and, and there could be risks there. The reason I don't think it is as complicated is because of, of information technology and software systems. You, you can design a system where every segment of road has a price by time of day. It's all automated. It's just, just like my phone. I, you know, I don't have to, you know, I make all these calls and it's all automated. So I, I think that I wouldn't worry about that in, ter in terms of, uh, you know, fraud or other things like that. I think that's a risk. But if you, I think if you have the right cybersecurity features, as well as making sure that the hardware in the vehicle itself that is designed, the hardware and the software are tamper proof, uh, then I think you, you know, probably deal with most of that. Maybe there'll be half a, you know, 1% of, a 10th of a percent of, you know, supercomputer savvy scoff laws maybe, but uh, you know, I don't think it's, the average person's not gonna do engage in fraud, I would argue. It's just the equivalent of dialing back your um, your odometer, but for the 21st century, is that what? Yeah. Uh, Try, try uh, dialing back your odometer now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, Chai Ching, uh, we have a question here about 199A. Um, would it be a mistake? I mean, I know, uh, I know your position already is that there should not be a pass-through deduction, but is there a particular concern about raising the corporate rate while leaving the preferential rate for, for pass-through businesses on the individual side? Yeah, that, 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 that's a great question. And uh, look, I, I think this is another example of why there's a, a lot of complementarity between proposals across different parts of the, the code. 
one of them being that you you never want to have very large gaps on the rates and inclusion of income from different sources because that becomes a tax sheltering magnet um, and we've you know talking about trucks and 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 uh, other types of of hauling equipment one of uh, the, the things that I remember from when the 2017 tax law was first enacted was a tax advisor saying to his uh, to his colleagues at a, a conference of tax advisors that one of the, the jobs of those tax advisors was to load up their clients' money on trucks and drive it through the, the new loophole in the code, which is 199 cap A. So, you know, to, to, to me, I think both making sure that that, that rate is, is higher and getting rid of the deduction itself uh, overall would be a, a much better way to go. Uh, but those types of provisions in the code are really a magnet, magnet for sheltering. Thanks so much. So we only have about seven minutes left. I want to ask a couple of rapid fire questions where um, you all try to give me some quick answer. But what do you think is the most important or your favorite part of, of the infrastructure bill, um, the, the American Jobs Plan? Adele? Oh, man, you caught me off guard there. I think um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little bit of a vague answer and say the spirit with which it's intended. I mean, I really do think that there's long-standing infrastructure needs in, in our country. And um, it's really time to get on the stick and figure out how to, how to undertake those investments. Everything from deferred maintenance in our national parks to um, crumbling and unsafe roads and bridges around the country. So, you know, I'm not gonna pick one out, but I, I think that the package is extremely well intended and there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, and I look forward to the fulsome debate this bill will have. Rob, what do you think? Well, look, I think, first of all, the, our infrastructure is nowhere near, as everybody says, crumbling. It's, it's not really crumbling. You look at the DOT numbers, it's, it's, you know, sure, it could be better, but it's not anywhere near as bad as it is. The, the, the engineers, uh, civil engineers put that out because they want to make it look a lot worse than it is. The favorite, my favorite part is clearly the R&D and manufacturing part. Uh, it to me is the single biggest challenge the U.S. faces, and that's declining um, manufacturing and advanced technology competitiveness, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. We're not doing anywhere near enough. We're spending less on R&D than as a share of GDP than before Sputnik. Uh, we're, we're, we're about 25th in, in among the OECD countries on funding our universities and research. I mean, that's what we should be focusing on in this bill. I would just fund all the infrastructure, particularly the highway, but just fund it through the highway bill, fix that. You don't need it. You don't need this big bill to do that. So that's what I would focus on. Thanks. Charging favorite part could be on the tax or the spending side. I really hope when we see part two that I get to say um, a multi-year mandatory stream for the IRS along with uh, authorities that would allow it to do its its job better. Uh, and I also hope that when I when I see part two, I'm going to be uh, torn between saying that and the fact that the, the the package together goes in the direction of saying that actually competitiveness and growth at a sound for school future is better off uh, um, achieved by investing in things like reducing child poverty, who are future innovators, are the future workforce, uh, as opposed to things like continuing tax subsidies for offshore profits and uh, other tax breaks for multinationals. Jeff, how about you? I like uh, most of the emphasis on, fix, on, on getting existing infrastructure to state of good repair as the top priority, because I'm tired of politicians talking about, we gotta fix our crumbling infrastructure, but when push comes to shove, they prioritize shiny new projects like the Silver Line to Dulles or, or things like that over actually fixing existing assets the federal government paid for to begin with. So if they're gonna talk about crumbling infrastructure, doing state of good repair is the top priority. And only once that's done, going on to, to new capacity probably makes sense. Although I will say that they do include new capacity for transit and rail, but not for highways uh, in, in this bill, if you look deeply enough. You know, some of us are looking forward to that silver line. Um, does anyone want to volunteer part of the package that they that they don't think and they think should be removed? I think they propose something that should be in there that's not. And that is a major push to modernize our air quality monitoring system. Right now, only 20% of US counties have even one regulatory grade air quality monitor. 
And we know that these monitors are not properly capturing pollution exposures to low income communities and communities of color. So I think we need, you know, out of the $2 trillion, maybe an extra billion to properly modernize our, our inadequate uh, monitoring and, and enforcement of air quality standards. Anyone, anything that anyone wants to remove? Well, look, I'll, nobody nobody wants to do that because you're not supposed to do that. We're, we're living in a world now where uh, there's no checkbook limitations and so we can have it all. So uh, why not double it all? Uh, look, seriously, what is the most important, given the fact that we have a massive budget deficit and we're not really going to, I mean, we're not going to raise taxes all that much. We need to be focusing on investment. We have the lowest rate of productivity growth probably in American history in the last 12 years. Uh, we have a big baby boom retirement thing. We have a competitiveness problem. We have a wage problem because we're not raising productivity. To me, the focus in this package should be on things that are going to have the biggest economic bang for the buck. And clearly to me, the thing that doesn't have that, and that's the home health care piece. That's not an investment. That's spending. Let's just ignore, stop putting everything. Oh, any, anything we like spending, we'll call it investment. You can call it what you want. It is not investment. It's spending. So if we want to do that, let's put it outside a bill have some kind of other package. This should be an investment bill. And I think there's gonna be another package coming up. So there should be some opportunities. Um, okay, so we have two minutes left. Now get one word answers. What is a tax um, or tax proposal that should be in this discussion that either we haven't discussed already today or isn't in the Biden plan? Uh, again, we'll go in the same order. Adele, Rob, Chai Ching, Jeff. Well, it's clearly the carbon tax. I mean, it should be in no, there. No, something that hasn't already been discussed. Oh, that today. hasn't something already new. been discussed. Yeah. You try to keep there. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm going to pass on that one. Well, I'm hoping to see in the next piece, uh, ending step up basis or some of the other uh, large breaks on income from wealth that at the moment either go untaxed or are able to be taxed. I'm going to stop. That's more than one word, Mark. Sorry. <laughs> you, 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 you Step didn't, up basis. You didn't Step use, the, you didn't use the buzzer. Word. There we go. <laughs> Rob? Yeah, tax dividends as normal income and use the money to double the R&D tax credit. Yeah, that was a lot of words. But... Cargo, contain cargo containers as they move from ship to rail to truck and back and forth as a way to tax it as a way to increase funding for our freight network. Right. Well, um, our time is up. Unfortunately, this is a great discussion. We still have about 30 questions in the queue I didn't get to. Um, but if everyone emails me, then I'll bug the moderators. I'm sorry, I'll bug the participants and ask them later. Thank you all so much for, for joining us today. Um, thanks to the audience for being here. Hopefully soon we'll be doing these events in person again. But until then, I wish everyone a, a happy, happy week and weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.